Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. Drought relief and broadband expansion are two of the high points of the new agriculture law. The Ag Commissioner provides details. Plus, the growler is now free. The Senate author talks about the changes to the state's liquor laws. Stay tuned for this and more on this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program, I'm Shannon Lurkey. A years-long effort to free the growler was one of the successes of the recent legislative session. Governor Tim Walz held a ceremonial bill signing at a suburban brewing company to mark some big changes to Minnesota's liquor laws, including allowing smaller breweries to sell four and six packs directly to customers and larger breweries to once again sell growlers. We want to welcome everybody for coming. This is a huge event for us. Thank you. We're very, very honored to have you guys all here for this historic event. We want to thank um, Representative Stevenson for um, authoring, getting this thing kind of kicked off. Uh, the Minnesota. <laughs> The Minnesota Craft Brewers Guild, this is, thank you, this is all, this is a huge step for all of us, the little guys. We can't be an impediment to ways that you can provide more revenue, and this piece of legislation lets you compete on that level. It was smart and well thought out. Um, it starts to give more opportunities, and I think these folks here, as I'd say again, this is tough to navigate these things. As I'm not telling anybody in this room anything, Minnesota's liquor laws are interesting um, in many cases. And, and, and to be able to balance all of the competing interests, um, all with the idea of, um, of doing it safely, properly, and giving entrepreneurs a chance to grow is, is really gratifying. There have been just so many breweries and distilleries that have popped up all over Minnesota, finding the best and the brightest creative entrepreneurs, people who are following a dream and and I just that is what all of this is about it to make it easier to make it more accessible to make sure that folks can can grow their businesses and really highlight uh, I think the best of Minnesota I think it's also just inherent we all know because we're standing in one that the breweries are also part of our culture right they, they draw talent in they draw people in there the reasons that you go to Little Falls or Brainerd or Stillwater or or any other town of the 226 breweries we have in our state, they bring people together and, and they and create new opportunities for, for tourism, for growth, for community and connections. So this isn't just about our economy and growth, although that's great. It's about uh, breweries and what they bring, mean to our culture. You know, it's been a long, long wait, but for craft breweries and craft distilleries all across the state, happy hour has finally arrived. <laughs> As the Commissioner said, we have over 200 breweries and over around 40 distilleries across the state that are just beloved uh, by the people who are in those communities. And it's great that we're giving them the opportunity to grow and thrive and innovate uh, and unshackling them from laws that were made at a time when this didn't exist. What is the importance of the Free the Growler bill? You know, it's amazing you ask that question because it's really about the small mom and pop shops, right? The neighborhood place where fo folks can gather. And it was like, can I take that six pack home? Can I take some? And the answer has always been no. It's been no, it's been no, right? And so what this is allowing is saying, you know what, we're going to value the neighborhood. We're going to value those small mom and pop shops that are going to be able to share their gift wares, so to speak, or share their expertise with other people around. It's why people are here, why they're gathered, just like this place here in, in Coon Rapids. As a mayor of Faribault, uh, knowing uh, touring uh, two harbors and what that does to that community for tourism uh, makes a whole lot of difference. Uh, private uh, sector businesses making the investment like this and then being cut off because they're too successful makes no sense to me. So I'm, I'm fully on board to make sure these guys uh, can do well, expand, uh, increase their sales, increase their production, and it's just great for Minnesota. Do you think that the COVID pandemic sort of changed minds about the need to have this ability for people to come have a beer and take some home with them? Uh, maybe a little bit. I, I think that it's been out there before the, the pre-pandemic, I think it was. I was coming up, uh, obviously, I was involved heavily with Castle Danger and then coming to that limit just before uh, COVID. So that's the big thing that I, why I got behind it. I saw the importance of, of Castle Danger and what it did for Two Harbors. So that's how I got involved. And I think uh, maybe the COVID did have an effect on it, but it's just great to see it done. We've been working on it for a long time. So it's just great, Shannon, to, to see it finally get across the finish line. 
Senator Karin Housley has been a leader in the multi-year effort to free the growler, an effort that became law last month. She joins me now to talk more about it. Welcome. Thank you. Free the growler. It is freed. It is freed. <laughs> you said that this has been an eight year effort to get this bill done. So why do you think that it took so long? I th well, it's, craft brewery, it's, it's a growing industry, continues to be. It, they had to organize themselves. You couldn't just have one craft brewer saying, this is something that we need. Uh, they had to, to get their group together, come to the Capitol, and tell us why it was important for all of our small communities, which it was very important. These, these brewers are, it's a, a, um, a, a craft that, that Minnesotans are really traveling around the state, picking up a growler here and there, and that helps in their growth. So this was a, this was a big deal to all of our craft brewers. Everyone is talking about freeing the growler. And for those who may not know, growlers are typically 64 ounce containers that craft beer connoisseurs can take to go, just like you said. So for example, a, cu a couple is gonna go visit a craft brewery. They try a brown ale that they think is absolutely amazing. They wanna take some with them, they buy a growler. What was the problem that some brewers were running into? So there is a cap. You could only brew so many barrels, 20,000 barrels. And once you hit that, so if, if it's Lift Bridge and Stillwater, once they hit the 20,000 barrel mark, they couldn't sell the growler anymore. And my daughter, she was actually up in Two Harbors and she went to Castle Danger and she calls me and she goes, Mom, can you believe you can't get a growler up here at Castle Danger? I just want to bring one home. Well, they far surpassed the 20,000 barrels. And so that's, that really hurt them because that's how they would grow their industry. They would, uh, they, they would test out a, a certain beer and see how the public liked it by the number of growlers and then they'd know to take that one to cans and bottles and to, uh, to liquor stores. So it was kind of their test market. So when you, you squelch a business from growing like that, um, uh, that's just not uh, the Minnesota way. So um, to let them go past that 20,000 barrel, I really wanted it to go to unlimited. I don't, I don't think we should put a cap on them at all to say you have to stop growing or stop selling growlers once you reach this cap. Um, but we, we've got it up to 150,000 barrels. There were only five small breweries in the country that weren't allowed to sell growlers because of the cap and they were all here in Minnesota. And so this cap, as you just said, it was 20,000. It goes all the way up to 150,000. You say you wish it were unlimited, but still that is a huge leap. What, how do we, how do we prevent any of these from becoming the next Budweiser? Or do we want to, like, is this, this just seems like a really big jump in, in the number of bar barrels able to be sold or the cap. Well, and I don't know why we would want to stop anybody from becoming the next Budweiser. Why would we, if Medtronic starts out of somebody's garage, why would we want to prevent them from becoming Medtronic worldwide? So I don't, I don't think I would ever want to stop them from becoming the next Budweiser. Liftbridge and Stillwater, that would be great. Um, what ended up happening with Liftbridge, too, is because there was the growler cap, they moved their headquarters over to Wisconsin because they didn't have that growler cap. So they employ more people over in Wisconsin, more tax dollars over to Wisconsin. It was sad because there was other places they wanted to expand here in Stillwater even, and they had to move. So it's, it was really important to raise that growler cap. And if a company wants to grow to the size of Bud Boy, Budweiser, so be it. It would be have, great to have another Minnesota beer company grow. Well, and so that begs the question, um, I was, in, in preparing for our conversation, I re-listened to the Senate debate on this bill. And at one point, I, I just sort of rolled my eyes because it was caps and barrels and milliliters and gallons and all of these measurements, uh, you know, the laws restricting this, you can do this, you know, I mean, it's really, it begged the question, is this level of complexity necessary in Minnesota's liquor's law, liquor laws? And I would assume that this is a vestige of prohibition. And my question is, will lawmakers just continually whittle away at some of these things to make it more of an open market? And should it be so? We, we did have some prohibition era liquor laws and Minnesota liked it that way. But uh, over the course of the last eight years, they really were pressuring us to to change some of those to help our small businesses grow. And I don't know if we're gonna keep coming back because this was a big one. Um, some of the some of the organizations have made an agreement outside of the legislature that they won't be coming back for a while because this was so huge. Uh, and again, like you said, the number of milliliters or barrels, all of these different numbers. Again, my daughter said, "Mom, this is crazy. This is crazy. What do you mean there's caps? I don't get it. Just let me buy a four pack from Liftbridge or Castle Danger." So, I don't think we'll be coming back for quite a while because I think this solved a lot of the problems of today.
Well, and one other thing we should mention, um, the benefit to some of the smaller brewers and craft distillers is that these small brew cubs, brew pubs can now sell four or six packs in addition to growlers. Um, and the distilleries can sell up to 750 milliliters per person per day. What does this mean for the bottom line for these smaller businesses? And it, again, it's not where they make their money. That's not it. This is just really a, a take home for tourists. They're not going to every day go get a four pack from their local uh, brewery. It, that's, that doesn't even make sense. It's more as a, a take home, go home, have your family try it. It's not a big money maker for the bottom line. And again, I wanted to, I forgot to add, um, we didn't add that they can sell more of their own product out their front door. That is still capped at 750 barrels. So once they reach that, they can't sell more than that in growlers or four packs. So it's not more going out into the market. That still stays the same. It's just allowing that brewery to grow, to sell even more so the wholesalers can get it out to the liquor stores. Again, very Thank confusing. You. <laughs> Thank you. So one other thing I, I must mention is, is that remarks at the governor's bill signing revolved around helping businesses and building community. Uh, the law also creates a new social district experiment in Anoka. It extends hours for some major sporting events. It allows strong beer sales at town ball games and auto races. But support on the Senate floor was not unanimous. Senator Mark Johnson raised concerns about making alcohol more accessible to people when alcohol abuse contributes to so many health and societal problems. How do you think about the more problematic aspects of alcohol use? Um, and, and everybody has to vote their district and everybody has to stand up for their district and your own beliefs and those are Senator Mark Johnson's beliefs. We took it as this was a small business trying to grow and that's what we were trying to help. Those other philosophical uh, differences between senators, that, that's something for them to fight for in their own district and on the Senate floor. And finally, one last question, because at a press conference you were asked why do we still have 3-2 beer in Minnesota? We are the last state in the nation to still have 3-2 beer. And you said that you were going to keep working on it. Is this, now you also said there maybe is going to be a break on, on liquor legislation for some time, but is this the next peg that needs to be, I don't know, cut off, fall, yeah, yeah, whatever? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, in that bill that we just passed, 3-2 beer, which was only allowed to be sold at resorts across the state, now that has been lifted. There are, you have Miller Brewing, Budweiser, they don't even want to make 3-2 beer because it's only here in the state of Minnesota, but we've got convenience stores and gas stations, that's all they're allowed to sell. So when they aren't going to get that product in anymore, then that's a product that they don't have to sell, which they do do a good deal of sales in 3-2 beer. So I do think it is ridiculous that we are the last state. I don't know if I'm going to be coming back with that next year, but I think it is something that we need to look at and get rid of it. Senator Karen Housley, always a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Shannon. In a legislative session that left a lot undone, including a tax bill, a bonding bill, and supplemental investments in education, health and human services, and public safety, an omnibus agriculture bill with relief for drought-stricken farmers was one of the few successes. Joining me to talk about the new law is the Commissioner of the Department of Agriculture, Tom Peterson. Welcome. Thanks. Great to be here. First and foremost, the new law provides $13.1 million to farmers who were adversely impacted by the drought last summer. I believe that the application window for this relief will open soon, but who will benefit and what do they need to know? Yeah, you know, it's, it's really hard to think when we've had such a wet spring that we had such a bad drought last year. You know, the worst drought we've had in Minnesota since 1988. At one point in August, 80% of Minnesota was covered by a severe drought. And, uh, you know, and just to see how that uh, impacted. And I am really glad to see that the legislators and the administration came together and we were able to pass this relief because, um, you know, I'm, I'm sorry that it took so long too for farmers because we did lose farmers that, that was just a lot. But the idea behind this was always behind uh, grants, $8.1 million that will provide some relief to the farmers, maybe help them pay a bill or two. Uh, we've done this before with dairy farmers and it does help. Uh, we also were able to backfill $2.5 million into our loan programs at the department. It's a 0% interest. And it's really focused on livestock and specialty crop uh, producers or farmers. So people that sell at farmers markets, people that raise cattle, 
uh, crop farmers, so your corn, soybean, wheat, they have crop insurance, which again, doesn't make people whole, but it's a better product than these farmers have. And so to have this, again, help people pay a bill or two, we have tremendous interest and it will open up soon and uh, the middle of the month and, and hopefully it will help. And we'll put up a link to information on that. Um, the law also includes investments in broadband to expand access to unserved and underserved areas of Minnesota. What does this mean for farmers and how does broadband access improve the agriculture industry? Well, I always say, Shannon, at my farm, I have five different ways to get on the internet, you know, and so whether that's hotspots or satellite or uh, other service, it's just really frustrating depending on where you live in rural Minnesota. And so I know firsthand. And so to have that uh, for farmers, whether it's GPS and, and different computer systems on tractors and modern machinery, to our smaller farmers that sell um, direct market, uh, our e-commerce program at the Department of Agriculture that helps those farmers build websites and uh, everything else is incredibly important. So having that uh, irrigators run on uh, uh, irrigation systems can run by uh, iPad or uh, your, your phone. And so all these things are very dependent. So it's great to see that investment too as well. I would guess that that saves water too, to have it sort of mechanized with the farmer able to interact in real time. Yeah, it's amazing the technology, even the companies that we have in Minnesota. We have a company called Earth Scout here that also helps uh, uh, test soil moisture and sends all the data right to your phone. And uh, so you can save uh, also fertilizer, pesticides, things like that. You're able to really uh, check. So having that uh, in, uh, investment is gonna be helpful. Well, and speaking of soil, uh, next year a half million dollars will be available for soil health financial assistance. Uh, I know that Minnesota is known for its very rich soil, but I also know that a lot of it ends up in the Mississippi Delta. Uh, what's the goal? What, what, how is this going to work? Yeah, and so we're really excited to have this. Uh, kind of, we, we wanted, to, you know, we're hoping for a lot more money, but we got our kind of foot in the door. We'll kind of be a pilot to. Uh, really help uh, jumpstart and boost some of our soil health uh, initiatives. This was supported by just about every agricultural organization. You know, as you said, soil is incredibly important. You need it, uh, you want to protect it, and there's so much going on that farmers are doing. And really will help support uh, cover, getting more and more farmers into cover crops, uh, reduce tillage, uh, subscriptions, uh, things that they use that help them encouraged to bring along some of those practices that will have multiple benefits, whether it's water quality, climate related, uh, you know, you mentioned holding uh, the, the soil here. And so we're really excited about that initiative as well. Um, there's also a half million dollars next year, one and a half million dollars in the next biennium to provide grants to assist people with down payments. I know that the average age of farmers is quite high. Um, I also know that the cost of getting into farming is very daunting. So. Is this to help that next generation of farmers and who might they be? You know, I think it's really interesting. And it's, uh, as you said, the average age of a farmer in Minnesota is almost 58 years old. Uh, you know, and I've seen statistics where 50% of the farmland in Minnesota is gonna turn over in the next 20 years. That's just with the baby boomer generations and everything else. And so, and uh, farmland can be very expensive. And, and uh, the, we have a lot of different, um, uh, we have an initiative at the department called our Emerging Farmers Program, where we're seeing whether it's Somali, Hmong, our Native American, uh, a lot of different populations uh, getting into farming. And so that down payment uh, can sometimes be a, a burden. That's one of the top things that we've heard that access to land, uh, getting that down payment is hard. I know as somebody who's bought a couple of farms that that is you know one of the things that's very difficult so this will be a pilot program that we can start and get going uh the mental health of farmers has been an ongoing concern we've talked about it before uh this new law provides additional funding twenty-two thousand next year and forty-four thousand in the next biennium uh with the increased awareness and additional funding to help farmers and those in the agriculture industry with their mental health, are we turning a tide here? You know, I, I hope so. You know, the one thing I'll say we're turning a tide is that we're able to talk about it more. And I think that's really good. But I think the challenges that we've had, you know, if you look at 2019, we had the wettest year on record for farmers. 2020, we had COVID, which really impacted farmers a lot. 2021, we had a drought. 2022, we've had the wettest spring on record. We've had just terrible storms, uh, high path avian influenza, 
all, and some one farmer I talked to last week, he had experienced all three of those. Uh, and you think about the mental health and stress, and, and it's, it's frustrating not to be able to get your crop in the ground when prices are as good as they are. And so we're glad to have the resources and the support the legislature has given us. This money supports our counselors that we have that are free to uh, farmers. We also have farm advocates that are free to farmers. So, um, but unfortunately, you know, we do, uh, we do continue to struggle and have people, uh, but we're glad that we have the resources and we always want people to reach out and to ask for help if they need it. Minnesota's legislature is divided. And as I said in the introduction, the agriculture bill was one of the few to, to finish. Is there, what, what, in your view, why is agriculture one of the winners? What, what are the areas of agreement between the Republicans and the DFLers on agriculture? You know, I think it's really just, you know, getting out and working. Uh, you know, uh, I, it's one of the great spaces to work in you know, at the Capitol. We have a lot of fun in the committees, I think. We have interesting discussions. We work really hard, I think, to not try to make it as personal as we can. Uh, you know, the story um, that uh, we were about seven o'clock uh, the night before, I really wanted to get this done. And Senator Westrom called me and, and he wanted to have pizza with me and Chair Sundin. And we got together and, and we hammered the bill out that night, you know, and so that really helps is having that camaraderie or really working together and trying to focus uh, support from all the agricultural groups, whether it's a larger or smaller organization really helps. And, uh, you know, and, and hopefully we can continue that because it is hard. You know, a lot of people think that they look and say, oh, Democrats are over here, Republicans are over here, and we don't get along. But there's many cases where we're able to push things forward. Commissioner Tom Peterson, always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Within the World War II Memorial at the Capitol, Governor Tim Walz, military leaders, legislators, service members, and veterans held a ceremonial bill signing for new laws aimed at supporting veterans and retaining National Guard members. This is the Legion, the VFW, the DAV, all of our veteran service organizations, and this year they did something that, that I hope we set as precedence from now on. They brought it to the legislators and they said, let's do a veterans omnibus. This needs to run separate from everything else. Let's make sure that we can tell veterans we will never trade a good policy on veterans issues for another issue. We will never put you in the last minute negotiations. We will simply move the policies, debate the policies, fund the policies that make the biggest impact on veterans and their families. I'll echo much of what the governor said when it comes to the bipartisan approach to ensuring that we put our veterans first, we make them a priority, and that we're passing good legislation on their behalf and recognizing the service uh, that they provided not only the state of Minnesota uh, but our country as well. It would be remiss if I did not take time to honor those who have sacrificed their lives in service to this nation over the many generations of Americans who have fought on behalf of defending our freedom and values that we stand for here in the U.S. and the state of Minnesota. Uh, and last but not least, I also want to make sure we acknowledge their loved ones. Oftentimes we talk about, we praise, and we show great uh, respect for our veterans and our service members and we forget the importance of the sacrifice that their loved ones also make. The husbands, the wives, the children, the mothers, the fathers, who sometimes don't get to welcome their loved one home. I believe that every veteran deserves a home. I believe that most Minnesotans believe the same thing. Therefore, ending veterans homelessness is a priority and will remain a priority for the Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs. This le legislation will help us in many ways. The first and foremost, it, <clears throat> it'll fund our, one of our strongest partners, which is the Minnesota Assistance Council on Veterans, or MACV. It'll continue their efforts to get affordable housing with vet for veterans with high barriers. We all know we're in a tight labor market here in Minnesota and we want to retain our trained and ready soldiers so that we can use them in the state and we can use them for our federal mission as the combat reserve of the Army and the Air Force. 
specifically, only about 23% of Americans are eligible to serve in the armed forces. And statistics say there's about 9% that have the propensity to serve. And I will remind you that only about 0.4% of Americans serve in the all-volunteer force. That is why it's extremely important that we retain our service members. Earlier this month, a trade delegation from Finland visited Minnesota to continue discussions on business and economic opportunities. I asked the governor whether he supports Finland's move to join NATO. We have made it unequivocally. We stand with Finland in this. What they're doing is trying to strengthen their partnerships. Many of you know here, um, our NATO partners, we have uh, security negotiations and security trades with our NATO allies. Myself, I've done four of those NATO missions to Norway. Um, it's in Finland's best interest, it's in America's best interest, and I think there's a real sense, and the Finns say when they come here they feel like they're home, and that's how we felt, and uh, they said we're really committed because we went to Helsinki in November, um, which says something. That group is committed, and what they believe is our move towards a clean, sustainable energy economy, our food uh, industry that's based here with our major food producers and of course our production, and then specifically our medical device companies. So I think now more than ever, Finland is strengthening ties. They've set it up with three states, predominantly Michigan and Minnesota, of they see commonality of things they want to work on. And so it was a very productive meeting and I think it's stronger than ever. And in the wake of recent mass shootings, Senate DFL lawmakers called for special session action on measures designed to curb gun violence. We also need to address the special session to finish the public safety bill. Standing with us today are Minnesotans whose lives have been shattered by senseless gun violence and who are sh here to share their stories to support or push to stop it. As a mother of two young children of school age, I've been shaken to the core with the recent massacres in Buffalo, New York, in Ovalde, Texas, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, Oklahoma, and many more. These incidents have become all too common in Minnesota and across our country. The GOP, unfortunately, has blocked our efforts to have a meaningful hearing and a vote on these bills, particularly in the background check and the red flag bill that I've been pushing for many years. Uh, we want to have this conversation and have these common sense proposals uh, heard, considered, and receive a vote in the Minnesota Senate. I am hearing from constituents, I am hearing from friends and family members around the state. I'm hearing from mothers that are literally taking their kids to school and crying because they are worried they're not going to be able to pick up their kids or they're going to get a call saying there's been a shooting at the school. I'm hearing from family members afraid to go to the grocery store or constituents who are afraid to send, have their grandma go to the grocery store because they don't know if there's going to be a shooting like that in Boston. We need to act. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.